Thank you, Vinny, for inviting me. My name is Torsten Walpi. Um, within SAP, um, I have two roles. One is I lead the Aerospace and Defense Business Unit. Uh, and on the other side, I also lead the cross project called Everything as a Service or Anything as a Service, Outcome-Based Business Models, New Business Models uh, Project. Uh, we wanted to share with you um, our efforts, our findings in this areas and uh, what we're doing in regards from, from SAP perspective. Torsten, uh, as you go through it, describe some of the industries where you've seen the interest, obviously aerospace, you know, the Rolls-Royce model, yep. a lot of people are hearing about, but describe some other industries where you're seeing interest. So the areas that we see a lot of interest is uh, industrial manufacturing, high-tech, chemicals, uh, consumer products even, uh, to, to, to the consumer side. Um, high tech is very, very big because of the fact that uh, a lot of the products there are uh, now put on, under subscription and, and there's already some big trend from a software perspective there and it's moving in the hardware side. Uh, we see it also in very large, uh, uh, now post COVID in large uh, complex manufacturing and products. Uh, where we see that trend coming in. Um, we see it actually in almost all the industries uh, to, to a certain extent. We did actually a survey across all the 25 industries, not 25, 24. Uh, we didn't do sports and entertainment, but we did all the other ones where we looked really in detail. Uh, we didn't find much in regards to government <laughs> as an outcome, but there are areas even in the government where, where they're looking for the outcome based, but it's not a, as a monetization effort in that area. Um, where, where you really see a lot of the efforts, especially during COVID, is uh, areas where uh, companies have to look to retain their revenue stream uh, and uh, also expand their revenue stream and also keeping customers. Uh, and uh, dealing with uh, the high uh, product prices uh, at the moment, uh, inflation and other elements in, in that area. So <coughs> those are all things that are coming into play for this. Um, and also the speed of innovation at the moment. Uh, that's, that's another area that drives uh, all these discussions within the different industries. And are the outcomes, the survey you did, are the outcomes all over the place or are they converging around uh, performance, machine performance, or financial results, or, oh, okay. Yeah, um, so he, here's a couple areas that we found um, that are really, really interesting. And, and what what we did actually, we grouped, uh, which, which you will see a little bit later, but uh, to answer your question, we grouped actually the outcome-based areas. Uh, as you nicely pointed out, there's uh, companies and industries that have dealt with those for many, many years. Rolls-Royce, as you mentioned before, is, is a veteran of 15 years in this area, which uh, started with Power by the Hour. Um, so you have kind of hardware-centric companies that build services around to basically move into a more of a consumer consuming perspective and uh, how their customers can use it uh, to services-based, where you have a service and you uh, uh, put things around it or software based, uh, right? Uh, so those three categories, we actually looked at it uh, from, from, from that area. And there are some similarities when you look at these different uh, streams in that area. But we also, from, from your perspective, what are some of the reasons why those folks go into that uh, segment? We see very much uh, drivers around revenue customer attainment or opening new market segments, right? Those are really, really, really big uh, drivers in that area. And now with sustainability, that's another layer that we see is coming back into it. And I'll explain to you in a, in a little bit why that is coming in and what we are doing from, from that perspective. Okay. So as I said before, uh, the, the revenue piece is really, really, really big. Uh, how do you grow your revenue? How do you market that area? Uh, that's that's 
super, 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 super critical. We see also, and there is actually a support not from what we just shown here, but um, I recently uh, picked up the book from uh, from the St. Gallen uh, University. They have done a, a study with uh, Boston Consulting Group that the, the revenue uh, itself of the companies are way higher and stronger and the growth of it is higher by going into that area. Yes, it is a shift. Yes, it is an organizational uh, you know, change, paradigm change when you go from selling a product to selling an outcome. Uh, but what, what, what you see is in that beginning stage, it has an impact on the revenue. But if you are um, <clears throat> in, in an economic crisis, like, uh, such as like Rolls Royce had or others, and shift in that a time over to that new business model, the expectation to the market is uh, completely different. And you come actually out of the crisis much stronger because you have a product and a service that looks at, at a, an easier way of consumption for your customers. And it's very much tailored to your customer needs uh, and, and drives actually way different product designs in that area. You know, you, it's also more aligned with the customer, right? So I talked to Nick Ward at Rolls Royce, and I said, you know, 2020 must have been brutal, right? Because they takeoffs were down, and he says, you know, that's right. But how many engines would we have sold if he had stuck to the old model, right? He says we are actually more aligned with the customer's business. If, if they weren't flying, we weren't making money. So that that really resonated for me. Yeah. And if you take this, right, the, the discussion, um, you know, post COVID now, if you look at an airline, um, now they have to really look at their their cost model, right, to acquire an engine, that's an, that's 60, 70 million dollars, uh, you know, for an engine, or, or a pair of engines, you know, that is at this time when you start up again, uh, that's just an huge expense, right? And if you stay with a servitization or outcome-based models, the threshold to get into the market, uh, to get engaged with a customer is just way lower, lower, and you can actually get more services out of it. The other piece, the other trend that we found is uh, the products itself, because of most of the servitization areas, and this is to the area down uh, on the bottom, is because of the fact that you shift from a CapEx to an OpEx, it is much easier for them to engage in it. It's much easier to get that uh, that contract through your, your cycle, especially in uh, areas of crisis, right? Uh, or economic situations or it startups puts, of businesses. Yeah. It puts the capital uh, capital owners to owner um, on the provider, yeah. right? Yeah. And we saw in technology, a lot of technology vendors in the last 20 years pretend as if it wasn't their responsibility, right? So that's, uh, that is, and they lost out, right? You've seen it in the infrastructure market where Amazon and Microsoft made the investments, many others did not, so. And, and to your point, so you see that shift of innovation too. So from a hardware perspective, as you rightly pointed out, you have way higher cycles of innovations going on, right? If you as a data center don't keep up with the latest chips and deploy them and have cycles to bring them in, that is just putting you behind the curveball. <clears throat> so we see that from a high-tech perspective, you know, from a hardware perspective, that the cycles of innovations are way faster. And in order to get there, it's, it's let's keep that with the experts, right? let's keep that with the guys that can offer me the service of it. And I don't want to invest every quarter, every six months, every year in the new set of hardware and technology and services. And I don't want to deal with cybersecurity around it, right? Uh, that's the aspects that the services that come around it. It's not just the hardware anymore. It's the services that build around it that people are looking for. So you, you as you rightly said, so you're much tighter to the needs of the, your customer and you provide more services that are tailored to the customer and to help the customer. And we find very often because you extend that life cycle of the product, 
you as an operator or a service provider that offers this outcome, you have now opportunities to cut the cost in, in the different areas because you can optimize ac across this extended life cycle of the product. And it's not just, you know, how do you sell a product, how do you operate it, it's also how you recycle it, right? So the end of life of the product, how you deal with this. So you get, we have seen areas where products are way more sustainable because now you have to bring a product out there where the maintenance cycles are in alignment with your, your customers. And it's not just I'm selling it and it can break to a year after your warranty <laughs> because you're operating it, right? You have to put better products in it because the cost of operating is going to be on your books. You're responsible for it. So you, you, from a sustainability perspective, you get into a completely different cycle of thinking about a product because you're producing. You also can refurbish because it's your product. You can refurbish, you can swap yep. things from one customer to another, you know. So, so long as you have the SLA, it shouldn't matter to them. Exactly. So, but that creates then, if you look at it, that creates completely different, uh, you know, risks and stuff like that. And, and this is kind of what we what we looked at it and, and, and I mentioned before, these are kind of sort of the, the types of uh, services that we've seen from a digital with software, uh, the intelligent products, and then truly the outcome based. These are kind of the, the uh, almost the, the journeys that companies go through. And, and on the right hand side, just a couple of companies that we looked at and how they deal with those uh, areas. Right, and each of these have different flavors, right? And it's a different way to get into those those uh, 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 engagements. Uh, th these are just a couple of customer reference stories. I'll send you uh, the, the details around it. But what you can see is it's exactly that journey of selling a product, if it's a software or hardware to truly using technology to manage the entire end-to-end -end process, right? And what I mean by that, it's not just a financial piece. Because of the fact that you're taking responsibility of another segment of the life cycle of the product uh, that was previously not under your jurisdiction, so to say, uh, you have to have technology in place to give you that information so you can you know almost have early warning systems what's going on in a, that area sometimes the hardware or even the software is used by your customer right how they use it how they uh, uh, put it in service is completely different you may have not thought of it right <clears throat> but now as you operate those things or provide the outcome and you have the sla you're responsible for that. So, are you seeing? Are you, as a result, are you seeing more digital twins? And is that SAP providing it, or are you partnering with somebody to provide that capability? So, you're absolutely right. Uh, the digital twin component is coming into the picture here, uh, out of uh, out of two aspects. Uh, one, because of the fact that you want to simulate especially in any of the hardware products that you want to simulate how is that product used for that environment, right? So upfront that you get the right product in place uh, in it. Also from a perspective of life cycle, if you understand completely the makeup of the product and you have the digital twin of manufacturing and then the digital twin of uh, operations, then you can manage this process much easier. And you can share some of those uh, elements also with your customers and refine the design based on on your 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 learnings and your SLAs. Um, we have uh, in SAP quite a bit of the digital twin components of it. Uh, we are partnering with Siemens and the other ones on the design side, right? Uh, but then, how do you take the design twin over into operations? In the operational twin, uh, that uh, in the SAP area, we have a solution in there. And what we actually find is very often you have a mix of digital twins and digital twin software providers in the marketplace. 
right? Um, does that mean, you know, SAP is maybe not looking at the design? Yeah, with our PLM solutions and partnership with Siemens, we can provide that element as well. But also from an AIN perspective, which is the asset intelligence network, from an operation perspective, we can take that manufacturing twin and bring it in, in, into the, the operational side of the house and manage it all the way through, right? And also see what the impact is of the operation to the twin. Data. Hagen, one of your colleague Hagen from the automotive group said, one auto maker is actually looking at putting that for every one of their cars out there. That would be, that would be amazing how much data that would generate. By the way, yeah, uh, I I agree. If you look at uh, how much data our friends at Rolls Royce that you asked before put together, it is it is uh, just alone that uh, it is a lot of data, right? Uh, there is for the A380. I think uh, if you have a, f a flight of an A380, uh, at some point of time, I I heard the number of one terabyte of data being created. Uh, so you can for my industry. Uh, why I'm super passionate about this is because of the experience we have with Rolls Royce and within the industry and the health monitoring uh, tools that are out there. Um, it, it really feeds nicely into uh, the overall outcome based area, right? Because you have to understand how the, the products are uh, used. You have to have the, the health monitoring pieces to it. You have to align it with your risk around SLAs and your business models to it, because if you don't uh, bring all these elements together, uh, it it is going to be just a, a leakage of of uh, of margins, right? It, it it will be extra cost, and that that will take all that part out of it. So, managing the cost, managing the operations, managing the product, and the making of the product throughout outcome based. Uh, no matter if you do this as a subscription, if you do that as a outcome-based contract, if you do this as a rental, that is super, 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 super important. And that's why we look at this actually from an end-to-end -end process. Uh, and we just wanted to, to show you uh, from from a from an area perspective, um, most of the companies, and even if you look at Rolls Royce, right, they put a separate organization out there. Uh, because if you look at, at, at the prospect of how do you manage this area, um, traditionally you had a sales organization that sold the engines or the, the hardware. Then you have a separate organization that does the aftermarket. They sell the spare parts and the services, right? And if you move then completely over into outcome-based, you're basically compromising the revenue in both areas. Okay. How do you balance this off? How do you basically uh, merge in the new business unit that is outcome-based versus the traditional areas? That is a big, huge organizational challenge. And also from a revenue perspective and also shareholder perspective, right? How you manage this, how you communicate that and, and all those uh, different areas. That's uh, that's super 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 critical in that area. Um, so sorry about the, the pop ups in in there. Um, if you look at it from an end to end process, the reason why we at SAP talk about this is because we have capabilities all the way from the R and D side to the manufacturing, to the sales, to the operation and. The, the life cycle management after that, and even to the end of product life cycle management element. So that that's kind of sort of where we're staying uh, with the stuff uh, and looking at it from, from an overall perspective. And this is just giving you a couple of the areas. And one of the, the really important discussions that we see uh, where a lot of companies end up first is really in the, as you said, the SLA and the billing piece and how you manage basically your your uh, charging uh, capabilities out in that marketplace. That's that's uh, something super, super important where a lot of the companies start with. And uh, we're fortunate with the uh, with our teams in, in the uh, Brim area so, to, uh, to, to go about these areas. So, Torsten, what I'm hearing is in the market, 
obviously subscription revenues with Zora and others has become more sophisticated. But it seems like outcome-based contracts are still, the tools are all over the place. A lot of spreadsheets still being used. But would you say that's, that's true? That's the state of the market? I, I would say that's where a lot of the companies start with. Uh, there are companies that are highly sophisticated uh, uh, in the area. Um, as you stated rightly, so a lot of the subscription folks, uh, which is a form of outcome-based um, or can be based on the contract, um, you see those folks, because of the volume that they have to deal with, they automated a lot of those uh, areas in it. Uh, we see a lot of the companies uh, that started in the outcome based, as you said, uh, with spreadsheets, right? Because they dabble into that area and go into it, but they realize really quickly that uh, spreadsheet management is it has its limits. And because of the fact that uh, you have to have uh, consistent data coming in and out from all the different operational areas, uh, that's w what you can do with Excel spreadsheets. You, you need to have uh, operational health monitors. You have to have monitors to, to look in what's happening at your customer side. And, 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 and you have to correlate those things. Uh, and you have to do simulation of those things. So that's why we also created this outcome-based business uh, model insights tool that help companies to really look at what's happening with your contract, what are the costs, what's the revenue, and what are the risk areas that you can uh, dynamically model based on your environment where, where the indicators come from. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, this, this is basically a couple, I, I, I put out a couple of uh, <coughs> slides. Go, 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 back to, go back to AIM, because that, uh, that is very unique to SAP, but it doesn't seem like you, it seems hidden within the SAP family. I have to, you know, every time I ask somebody at SAP about AIM, it takes a while to get information. Yeah. Um, I, I agree because um, a lot of the times, uh, a lot of the companies, focus on how do I sell my products? Um, and very often uh, AIN was basically developed in, in, in an area of saying, how can I make sure that my manufacturing or my operations are at nearly 100% without a disruption? And how can, can I bring my partners in to make sure that my operations are visible to my partners and they can do the best to keep me at 100% uptime, right? Um, planned uptime, not uh, when you have scheduled downtimes, that, that's part of a normal series, but the unplanned part that you reduce that as, as uh, much as you can, right? A and you can do that by showing visibility to your partners in it, the, the guys who make the machines and pick the machines that they have visibility into this. AIN itself as Asset Intelligence Network is going to be super critical for the operation in outcome-based or in servitization because you have to have that kind of infrastructure in place, as you said, to get that information from your right. customer. If that's a manufacturing um, machines or if that is uh, a truck or if that's a vehicle or if that is software or a data center, uh, whatever it is, you need to have those tentacles out to get that information into one place. Uh, Are you, is SAP sharing information on the AIM metrics? How many customers, how many assets type stuff? Because I, I, uh, I think you should publicize this a little bit more. Sometimes you talk too much about Ariba and your other um, networks. This doesn't get as much attention. You really should talk more about this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. This, uh, I think, um, with with outcome based, it is the centerpiece of our discussion um, because you need to have these tentacles in place uh, to to make sure that the companies can get that information and can share that information. Right? It's it's a two way discussion uh, around outcome based with your customers. 
uh, and that's the platform of Asset Intelligent Network. And uh, I can follow up uh, with our team to uh, understand how many customers do we have, how many assets are running on AIN. Um, I know that uh, over the last couple months, we have seen a lot of uh, traction and, uh, around AIN uh, in a lot of discussions. How can we onboard the networks and, 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 and. So that's for sure. Yeah, and uh, field service management, that's also critical. How do you get information <coughs> to your folks? On, on field you service management, do you have something for us? augmented reality in the field? Are you packaging Microsoft and other tools? Um, we we can uh, we partner with the augmented uh, reality people. We do have a uh, little bit uh, of partnerships in that area where you can get the data onto your classes. Uh, uh, we had, uh, I think, projects with two or three different uh, hardware providers in that area. Uh, and there's a couple of videos out there. Uh, so we're, we're partnering in that area uh, very strongly to, to get that information to, to optimize basically the efficiency of those field workers. And the safety, actually it's, it's uh, very often it's around safety uh, for those, uh, not, not only the quality. Especially during, especially during COVID, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of those uh, yeah, use cases uh, in, during COVID that was the safety uh, related stuff. Um, in there. Uh, this is the outcome-based insights. This is one, one of the tools that I mentioned before. Uh, this is really where you can see uh, the insights uh, to your contracts uh, that you have uh, and monitor those from an from a operational perspective, from a revenue perspective, as well as from a cost perspective and the, the different cost elements, how they come in and the performance of it. Because that you know, if you have specific SLAs, and you're you're uh, back to gathering the data through AIN of uptimes, uh, those can result in penalties, right? Uh, so therefore, uh, to understand really the the uptimes of the systems uh, in alignment with your SLAs uh, is is super super critical because it's all about risk management. If you take uh, a, 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 yeah an outcome based approach. Uh, and also a close collaboration with your customers in this area. And then uh, what we find, which is the next version of uh, the capabilities that we're building in, it's these simulations. So what happens if you do this to the product? Uh, how will that improve my SLAs? How will that improve my, my uh, uh, performance? How will it reduce risk, right? Those are the areas, and, and we believe, even though this is, uh, you know, an analytical tool around it, uh, what we found in all the discussions across all the different industries, uh, that it's all about risk management. It's all about the insights, um, especially if, if companies enter into a new area. And when you talk to Rolls Royce, they probably said the same thing: is we understand what the market is doing and how it's relating to us. We wanted to understand how our customer X is using it, uh, what's happening there, what's what's the impact from, from a service management perspective, from an uptime perspective, from a cost perspective. Um, and so it, it's, it's all about getting the insights into those operational areas. And it's an end-to-end -end process. It's not just a uh, you know, stovepipe, I'm field service or I'm spare parts. It is truly, you know, the design, operate, and end of life. I don't know what, you mentioned chemicals. I don't know where you see outcomes there. Uh, actually, there are already uh, several of the outcome-based areas. Uh, one is uh, Linde, for example, or um, Air, uh, what's, what's their name? They're filling, they're providing uh, these gas tanks and they oh, already yeah. have some subscriptions. Air liquid, air liquid? Air liquid, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Thank you. Um, it just popped out of my mind. The other areas that we see it, um, a couple of the paint uh, manufacturers are getting into selling the painted roof versus the paint. True, true. Um, so from a consumer perspective, you have that piece, right? Um, 
we have, I ran across uh, one that's a diaper service. Uh, they, they, they provide you with clean diapers. <laughs> it's a monthly subscription and uh, uh, th those areas, I ran across a furniture company in Germany that is providing <coughs> furniture as a service um to to other areas i i think um we will see more and more uh in that area where velocity especially for uh around i don't know torsen we're not that old we don't need diaper as a service <laughs> <laughs> yeah I I, I I i mean you can see that uh, it, it gets into right. market areas that uh some people may have never thought of it right uh I, you know, this is for a long time we were hearing about outcome based. I think in the last year, it's really accelerated. Maybe the COVID has done it, or maybe the uh, market has become more sophisticated. Tools are becoming more sophisticated, so people are able to apply it more. Yeah. No, I think uh, you're absolutely right. It's it's the it, it's. I think what I see it's three influence factors. One is we have the tools now. We have the digital tools that allow us to manage this in a different way. Uh, number two is um, there is a trend of higher innovation and not constantly go and buy the next iPhone or the next tool with the next features. Uh, and uh, three, so it's a next generation of buyers in there. And I think it's also um, accelerated by COVID. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, there is some buying happen, habit, habits that completely changed uh, in people. Uh, the sensitivity to health, the sensitivity of to how do I engage with the customers is going to, uh, is it changed quite a bit or influenced quite a bit that allowed the fact of saying, hey, we need to think completely different in this area. And what, what we also see very often with bigger ones, uh, when they engage in in a in a transformation to outcome based that's usually throughout financial crisis or health crisis or other crises where it allows them to shift easier especially easier, right uh, right, right, right. Uh, think think of it uh, like you just stated before if rolls royce is now down um they can argue to the market look our customer market is down the expectation of selling these products we don't have to, uh, you know, explain to the market why why we don't sell anything because if our customer is not flying, we're not selling flight hours. Very simple. But on the other side, when they start flying again, the recovery in that area, the bull whip effect afterwards, there is no bull whip effect because they're flying, they're paying, they're there, right? If you would have to sell now an engine in the market, you have to wait till they get to a stage of I'm now ready to invest again, right? So th that's that's the kind of uh, dynamics we see in happening, which will, uh, I think, uh, open a door for a lot of companies to think about outcome-based.